Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. Today I'll talk about uh, clinical evidence of baricitinib for treatment of COVID-19. So I think by now we already know about this. So uh, the, the progression of COVID-19 is due to hyperinflammatory res uh, response, thus by giving immunomodulators such as steroid, uh, interleukin inhibitors or JAK2 inhibitors would uh, improve would benefits to curb the cytokine storm. So when we talk about immunomodulators, there's three types of, uh, there's more type, a lot of uh, immunomodulators, one of which is corticosteroid. It's a very broad and potent anti-inflammatory because of, of broad action, it has a lot of side effects. However, it's cheap and widely available compared to monoclonal antibodies in which it only inhibits single cytokine pathway. So is able to avoid a lot of the side effects uh, uh, by corticosteroid. However, it's very expensive in UMMC. It costs about 4,000 for 70 kilos per person uh, with limited availability. So that's something in between with the check inhibitors. It's offered a compro uh, uh, not too broad, not too narrow spectrum. Can we change to uh, this uh, slideshow? Sorry, mata tak nampak orang tua. Sorry. Uh, is it slide show? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect now. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, so it's blocked on the cerebral cytokine pathway. It's not that broad as corticosteroid. Uh, thus, it less uh, side effect compared to corticosteroid. Compared to the cost, it's slightly cheaper uh, for normal uh, non-obese persons compared to uh, tocilizumab. So what is baricitinib? It's an oral check one and check two inhibitors, which is being approved for treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So researchers have used uh, artific artificial intelligence to predict the use of baricitinib in COVID-19. So they had validated in, in vitro models, followed the success in four case uh, pilot studies. No? So the mechanism of baricitinib basically it inhibit the intracellular signal pathway of cytokine and also had antiviral effect in which it prevent the virus entry to the cell. So is baricitinib effective for treatment of COVID-19? Basically, I had done a kind of a systemic review through pipe maps, had found a lot of articles. Out of them, I found two RCTs, uh, about seven uh, observational studies. No? So we start with a few prospective and retrospective study first. First is by Cantini et al. Basically, it's a multi-center study comparing baricitinib with Caletra and low molecular weight heparins compared to hydroxychloroquine and also the standard of care. So they recruiting uh, COVID-19 people with moderate pneumonia, which is, I would say, category three, uh, with mild to moderate ARDS. So in this study, they excluded corticosteroid. Patient on corticosteroid is not ex uh, included. This is before recovery trials result. So basically, the baseline characteristics were compatible in two arm. Uh, there's improvement of the symptom with baricitinib after week one or week two of baricitinib started compared to hydroxychloroquine arm, uh, even biochemistry. Uh, the interesting about this is when baristenic added into the st uh, standard care of treatment, there's reduced ICU transfer or the need of ICU at one week or two weeks and also reduced mortality. So this study showed that baristenic had uh, reduced the mortality and also reduced need of ICU beside improvement in, in terms of the clinicals and also biochemical after week one and week two. Next is from TV at all, basically is comparing baristenic compared standard of care, which is caletra and also hydroxychloroquine. So as we can see here, uh, with baristenic is improve uh, the CRP and also faster oxygen improvement uh, can be seen after four days uh, compared to there's no baristenic treatment. In terms of mortality, uh, it, baristenic uh, improve the mortality, but it's not associated with improvement in terms of ARDS incident and so duration of hospital stay. Next, by stabbing jet all, 
this is a cohort study in uh, Italy. So they're comparing very systemic versus standard of care in which the standard of care is a concomitant antiviral therapy of, and also hydroxychloroquine, caletra, antibiotic, corticosteroid, and solo molecular heparin. So in this study, uh, baristinic had showed uh, significant uh, uh, in terms of reducing in the need of invasive mechanical, mechanical ventilations or mortality with the hazard ratio of uh, 0 0.29, and it is really significant. Next, uh, by Falcon et al. Uh, basically, the study is initially to, uh, to study the effect of low molecular weight heparin, but they also included patients on baristinibs in which baristinib given at this uh, with mild to moderate ARDS, uh, I would say it's category three, uh, category four and above, if we're using our Malaysian category. Lah. So here we, we saw in the uh, multivariate analysis, only low molecular weight heparin associated with reduced mortality, but steroid and baristinib is not associated with reduced risk of mortality. Uh, while steroid and low molecular weight heparin associated with reduced uh, mortality and also severe ARDS in such patient. Next, by uh, Rodiquis uh, et al., in which uh, they included patient with uh, moderate to severe COVID-19 pneumonia. So in this study, they comparing corticosteroid and baricitinib versus caletra, hydroxychloroquine, and also corticosteroid. So their standard of care is composite of uh, uh, caletra, hydroxychloroquine, and if patient with respiratory failure, they may give IV IVIG or interferons, and some pass with methylpainsalon or other medications. So, by giving baristinib is not associated with mortality, uh, increased rate of mortality or ICU admission compared to standard uh, standard of care corticosteroid. However, um, baristinib arm um, showed uh, reduced need of uh, oxygen at discharge and also even at one month of discharge. There's more people discharge without requiring oxygen even after a month or on discharge. So. Basically, uh, baristinib with without remdesivir is an alternative for treatment of COVID-19 if cort uh, corticosteroid is contraindicated. However, remdesivir is not available in Malaysia. Can we use baristinib alone? And is there any clinical benefit uh, adding baristinib with corticosteroid or tolucizumab? So there's two randomized control trials to answer our question. First is by uh, Khalil et al in ACTT2 trials. Basically, it's an RCT it's comparing remdesinavir plus baristinib versus remdesinavir and also placebo. They included uh, WHO or you know, scale four, which is equivalent to our category four, or uh, does require oxygen, sorry, WHO, uh, which is uh, does with pneumonia or requiring oxygen, and even does intubated or requiring ECMO. In this study, they not included patient on uh, steroid, except if they have indication, for example, acute exacerbation of asthma or adrenal insufficiency. Most of the patient included in the studies, uh, I would say is category four, uh, hospitalized with requiring oxygen. More than 50% of them in that category. Uh, Baristinib had associated with a shorter uh, time to recover recover by one day. And this is more pronounced when we see this require high flow oxygenation in which ordinal score of six. However, it's not associated with a reduced mortality in which uh, there's no significant difference between placebo arm and also baricitinib. Baricitinib also that should able to reduce the hypoxemia progression to hypoxemia by 17%, uh, but not hospitalization, stay uh, hospitalization stay. It also associated with reduced need of uh, invasive mechanical ventilations or ECMO by 5%. Next, uh, in cost on barrier study, uh, in which they're comparing baristinib versus standard of care 
and also placebo was a standard of care, about 80% of the patients uh, uh, of, of the participants on corticosteroid, they included those who are category three, uh, our cat three with evidence of inflammatory, hyperinflammatory hyper response. So basically the demographic is quite, uh, quite uh, similar in both placebo and also baristamid arm. We can see baristamid usually started at day seven and above, and most of the participants are, I would say, is category four. And patients who are intubated or at home are well contra contraindicated in this study. Uh, this study showed a significant improvement in terms of the mortality with number needed to treat is about 20. We only need to, to treat 20 patients to reduce uh, one mortality in patients treated with baristamid. However, it failed to show the superiority in terms of the primary outcome in which the progress to high flow oxygen and IV or mortality, there's no different in terms of number of ventilated free days, hospitalization, also median time to recover. So uh, the overall mortality is more uh, is uh, significantly improved with number needed to treat uh, of 20, and it's more pronounced in those with required high flow oxygenation before they intubated with hazard ratio of 0 0.52. There's another uh, observational study, which is a small study comparing uh, baristinib or tolicilizumab in COVID-19, in which they recruited those with intestinal pneumonia with moderate, uh, mild to moderate ARDS, uh, most of the study, I mean, they have bari monotherapy plus corticosteroid, about 92%, TOSI plus steroid, uh, bari and TOSI plus steroid, and without bari uh, or tocilizumab. Uh, basically, there's no significant difference in terms of the mortality of each arm. So bari, TOSI had similar efficacy in terms of reduce, reduction of the mortality. So this is the summary. So there's two RCT showed that Baris, uh, Baris Tenet had improved in terms of the mortality in, added with tocilizumab and also progression to hypoxemia. And there's other studies also showed a very good outcome with Baris Tenet. In terms of safety outcome, for treatment of baricitinib, for long-term use of baricitinib in RA is associated with mild side effects such as um, um, URTI, not GI symptoms. It's also associated with infection, uh, some cytopenia, GI disturbance, cardiovascular, and also high CK. So I had summarized into this table in which there's no uh, alarming uh, evidence of usage of baristinib for COVID-19 associated with increased risk of cytopenia, thrombosis, infections, uh, transaminitis, or other side effects, except if using a higher dose or loading dose of baristinib in which it's associated with thrombocytosis or and higher evidence of mild ulcer by Hassan MJ and all. So now it's come to discussions. So when we want to use baristinib, um, any roles of baristinib in intubated patient because the study, I mean, the, the two study, I mean, although the ACT22 study included uh, this on intubation, but we see the improvements on the, if they're not uh, intubated or on ECMO, if there's, um, because we know COVID-19 is associated with when it's Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, it's okay, go ahead. Sazali, go ahead. Okay. So, um, so where if we know uh, Barisne, uh, I mean, COVID-19 is with high risk of VTE. So in the presence of VTE or suspicion of VTE, should we use or continue using baricitinib? And when to use baricitinib versus torosuzumab? This is something that I think uh, we should discuss for so that we kind of have a, what we say, national consensus when to use so that we can, um, I don't know, 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. Incredible. So, uh, I thought we were going to give okay. answers okay. for all those okay. questions. Okay. <laughs> um, on the way or... So, so maybe we should... Okay. Okay. Uh, the case okay. discussion, the case discussion and see then what other okay. people think about it. Basically, we are... Uh, okay. Just, uh, so uh, just a minute. Just a minute. Absolutely. Uh, who is NK? Can you mute yourself? Uh? NK, Which please thing? mute yourself. Um, um, okay, fine. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, this is the NIH uh, guideline uh, of management of COVID-19. They recommended using either baristinib or uh, tocilizumab uh, in combination of dexamethasone plus or without remdesivir for patients on high flow oxygen or non-invasive mechanical ventilation. But there's no evidence for just one uh, and yeah. So, so usually we're giving baristinib, the dose is four milligrams daily for 14 days or till discharge, which one is earlier. This is the adjusted dose of the baristinib. So I'll share a short experience of UMMC for a few patients, and I think Lim will continue sharing their experience in Sungai Bulu. So basically, um, we have a 63 years old gentleman who uh, with uncontrolled diabetes, he presented at day three of illness with fever and shortness of breath. He was on category three on admissions. However, next day he disintegrated in which we started dexamethasone six milligram. However, next day he further disintegrated very rapid increasing oxygenation until required high flow as a cannula. So CRP also, I mean, it's very high during that time. And we decided to start baristinib renal adjusted one milligram daily. So then the renal improved, we increased the uh, baristinib dosage. Um, patients are kind of static, but doesn't require intubations. Uh, ICU also had presumptively treated with hospital required pneumonia for this patient with tezosins. Uh, then we can see the progress. The CRP only can, we can see the improvement in the CRP after day four, day five of uh, baricitinib. Then patient continue to improve uh, and doesn't require further, I mean, invasive mechanical ventilations. Our next patient presented at day six. He's a, she's a morbid obesity. Uh, however, no disintegration because it's category three, we only started DVT prophylaxis. Uh, young with uh, obesity, after three days, she desecrated and three days later, two days later, increasing further the oxygenation in which we requiring bari. So CRP also kind of uh, jump uh, at day 10 of illness. Then with baristanib, we can see the CRP, in, there's no much CRP improvement during the first few days. Only after day four of baricitinib, the CRP coming down, and then patient continued to improve after that. Our third patient, 67 years old, with diabetes, also history of uh, some operations, was presented at day, sorry, I forgot to put the knee. Um, about day five of illness, that desaturated in and in, in, in transferred to us, started of dexamethasone, however, three days in our hospital, further deteriorated, increasing oxygenation. The RP also is uh, not much improvement this, despite dexamethasone in which we decided to give Bari. After uh, four days of baricitinib, bari she developed transaminitis in which we need to inhale the baricitinib. However, the CRP uh, is slightly increased because of some infections, but patients continue to improve and finally manage to off the oxygenation after about a week uh, in the hospital. I think that's all for me. Maybe I'll pass to Lim. Uh, a very good afternoon, uh, Lim KC here. Uh, can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay, so... Um, so, uh, Sungai Bulo started to use baricitinib. The first patient was given baricitinib on the 16th of June. So, it's, we have limited experience only, uh, about two weeks. 
So uh, out of the first cohort about eight patients, I will share two cases here. So the first patient is a Mr. JB, is a 48 years old gentleman with a BMI of 26, uh, no previous comorbid, was admitted on the 13th of June. The diagnosis upon admission was COVID-19 pneumonia, day nine of illness category four requiring a, a face mask five liter with hyperinflammatory hypoxia CRP of 6.7. And you can see the x-ray here, there's a GGO, especially at the peripheral distribution. So uh, the initial treatment given was a uh, metabolic two milligram per kilo as well as the uh, inosaparin. So at your leftmost column here, this is the first day data. So it came in with the face mask five liter six point, uh, CRP 6.7 as mentioned. So is, if you could see after second day, uh, the CRP slightly improved that the face mask- Sorry, uh, can you explain your CRP values? Uh? I'm sorry, I was saying why below CRP value is milligram per deciliter. So in other center, most of which is using milligram per liter. So uh, it will be equivalent to 67 in other centers. Okay, so you need to times 10. Okay, so uh, so for the first three days of metaprep, the oxygen remains static at face mask five liter, but it seems there's a slight improvement in terms of CRP. But patient has a deterioration occur uh, despite after three days of metaprep on day four of metaprep, uh, which is day twelve of illness, so the oxygen requirement increased to eight liter, CRP rebound to eighty nine, and and uh, uh, so at that time they uh, decided because uh, at the same time if you see the next slide. On the day 12 illness, the x-ray uh, is also worsening. So based on deterioration in terms of oxygenation, CRP and chest x-ray, so uh, the decision to add on body sediment was made that time. Uh, of course, at the same time, invariably, we can't rule out bacterial co-infection, culture, CRP, uh, PCT was taken, erosifin was started, and uh, PCT that time was 0.34. So this is the X-ray I show on emission as compared to the time of deterioration to face mask egg litter with rebound CRP. So uh, one day after Bari, patient continued to, to, to deteriorate. And, and actually we observed the same pattern as in UM of which Bari citinib take about three to four days. Uh, for the uh, fastest is 48 to 72 hours for the patient to have a response in terms of uh, CRP. As you can see after only a day four of the body citinib, then we can clearly see a reducing trend of CRP and as well as a reduction in the high flow mass from 15 liters to 12 liters. Uh, subsequently, bar culture will no grow. Uh, so uh, we completed rosephine five days. Then uh, we continue with the body citinib. Then uh, you, you can see, but uh, X-ray changes might lag behind, but there's no further worsening of the chest X-ray changes. Uh, then uh, patient continue to improve actually in terms of oxygenation, just that on day 18 of illness, there's slight rebound in CRP again, zero, uh, from 74 to 96. Uh, repeated proca remain low at 0 0.2. Uh, that time did a HRCT scan, which show uh, COVID-19 with features of OP, with total lung involvement more than 79%. Hence the decision to give another two day short course of a two milligram per kilo metal prep here, and subsequently patient uh, improve uh, further. So this is the, just to show the HR. CT scan HRC. As you can see, there's a lot of GGO and both a central and peripheral distribution, as well as the perilobular density. Uh, otherwise there's no other uh, remarkable changes and it's worse at the lower zone as uh, commonly seen in COVID. So uh, patient continued to improve, became room S, CRP was uh, low 22. So well, still a change to pregnisolone, tapering five milligrams every five days. And eventually patient was uh, completed by recidivate day 13. Uh, this is an x-ray upon admission. Uh, yeah, it still looked bad, but then the, the uh, patient clinically improved, CRP improved. So we discharged with a TCA two weeks. So in summary, in our first case, so uh, is a gentleman who is admitted on the day nine of illness with hyperinflammatory hypoxia, then CRP rebound on day four, metalprat, uh, worsened both oxygen, chest x-ray CRP. That, at that point, baricitinib, rosapine was started. Uh, hindsight, uh, culture no growth, PCD 0.34. Uh, 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 we took it took about three to four days, uh, three days usually to after initiating baricitinib treatment before seeing a response in the CRP and oxygenation. 
Uh, in this case, patient had another small rebound in CRP on day 18 of illness, but without concomitant deterioration of oxygenation given two days of metaprep in between before switching to prednisolone 0.5 mg per kilo per day. And he was discharged well on day 24 of illness. And by that point, he already completed Bari for 13 days. Then we go to the second case. Uh, second case is a uh, Mr. CKC. Uh, it's a 62 years old uh, gentleman with the underlying hypertension on Telmisatan. He was admitted on the 12th of June with the diagnosis upon admission is COVID-19 pneumonia, day 8 of illness. Again, hy uh, hyperinflammatory hypoxia requiring nasal prong and CRP of 6.6. And this is an x-ray on admission. Uh, he was given Dexa 12 mg in, in addition to that, uh, uh, Claxin and Fabi. He is a transfer in case from Mark East. The Fabi actually, in fact, already started there uh, for three days upon transfer to Sungai Bulo. So uh, he initially uh, showed improvement in terms of CRP after about three days of DEXA. Uh, subsequently, there's an increasing of CRP, there's, there's no worsening trend of the nasal prong. So we added on rosephine, but then with cultures, but we, we hold on, we didn't escalate the, the DEXA because there's no uh, deterioration in terms of oxygenation status. Uh, however, on day 14 of illness, as you can see here, the oxygen patient deteriorated from nasal prong 3 liter become high flow mass 15 liter and the CRP jump up from 41 become 181. Uh, the procal that time was 0 0.17 only. Uh, there's clearly evidence of hyperinflammation inflammation as evidenced by the high peritin and D-dimer. Uh, so it was escalated to metalpret. Uh, 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 the, then, then patient actually slightly it's improved with metalpret actually. Patient improved with metalpret. Let's show you the x-ray got new GGO worsening. Patient actually improved with metalpret. So deteriorated on day 14, started metalpret, improved with metalpret from high mass 15 liter to 10 liter, but he had uh, then CRP reduced from uh, 180 just now to 74. And he had another deterioration on day 18 of illness uh, with the rebound CRP and the rebound in, increase in the oxygen requirement to high mass 15 liter back. That's what occurred despite in the presence of uh, metalpret. So again, uh, at that point, baricitinib was started, kefepin was started as well. And uh, again, we, we, we talk about, uh, so this is an x-ray, uh, as you can see the lower zone, uh, the, the, the GGO looks more dense as compared to the one in, on emission. And this is a CT done, which actually uh, again show uh, patchy GGO, uh, again the central and peri distribution and the basal collapse consolidation as well. And, Okay, so uh, so metalpret was uh, metalpret after the second deterioration. So metalpret and baricitinib was started. Subsequently, uh, Procal came back to below 0.08. Culture no go. Cafepin were off. Uh, then subsequently, after the uh, baris, ad addition of baricitinib, patient responded continuously. Improvement in uh, oxygen and CRP. Patient currently is still with us uh, in our rehab board in the MDSU. Uh, on nasal prong with the tapering pregnisolone and baricitinib uh, was off after seven days. Okay, after the CRP uh, has became very low, uh, 12. So in summary of the second case, so this gentleman admitted on day eight of illness with hyperinflammatory hypoxia, CRP of 68. Uh, on day 14 of illness, he deteriorated from nasal prong to high flow mass with rebound CRP. That time the deterioration happened uh, in the present, in the background of dexamethasone, so the decision of escalation to without prep to migrant per kilo. Uh, initially slightly improved for, for uh, three to four days. Uh, another deterioration on day 18 of illness where, where the oxygen is back to high flow mass again from face mass 10 liters, CRP increased to 100 again. Uh, in, in the presence of a day five meetup, hence the decision to adding a baricitinib and cafepin. Uh, hindsight, there's no strong evidence of sepsis uh, and patient clinically not septic. And uh, after addition of those treatment, uh, patient improve and now on nasal prongs, CRP or rock bottom about 12 and, and on tapering pregnisolone now. So these are the two highlights of the cases uh, uh, that we see. Uh, but of course, a million dollar question is when should we give baricitinib? Uh, just in my humble opinion, uh, I think to, to, 
for the in terms of pathophysiology, how it works is a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor. Patient must have uh, evidence of hyperinflammation to begin with. And a patient can be admitted uh, if high flow mass oxygen support with barrier uh, uh, or worsening face mass oxygen support despite steroid therapy. And uh, X-ray must have a uh, worsening despite on steroid therapy or at the beginning or very bad on multilobular involvement. That most importantly, we must rule out uh, bacterial sepsis before considering adding an immunomodulator agent. Okay. Thank you. Okay, hi, Assalamualaikum, and a very good afternoon to all. So we'll be sharing um, some data on the usage of baricitinib and tocilizumab in HTAR. Uh, this data has been collected by our pharmacist, Dr. Aliza and her team. And uh, before I proceed, I'd just like to brief you that um, our incentivist has started using baricitinib from May this year. And all the patients that are on baricitinib uh, usually in ICU. So basically, baricitinib is started only in ICU. It's an ICU budget. And uh, for us, uh, we have been starting to see Lizumab in the wards because um, from March onwards, it seems like the patients deteriorate and uh, it was a bit difficult to get ICU to take our patients promptly. So patients with rapid deterioration needing high flow mass and above, we start to see first in the ward. So this is basically just um, uh, some demographics and uh, managed to analyze the outcome. So total about 101 patients have been put on baricitinib from ICU. Uh, the age group is quite similar compared, uh, comparing baricitinib and to C. Uh, about 77, of, uh, 77 patients on to C lizumab have been uh, used here in HTAR. And uh, in terms of outcome, I think many of you will be interested to find out what the outcomes are for these two group of patients. And on the body arm, uh, amongst that 101 patients on body, or, or put on that medicine, 85 or 84% uh, seems to have lived and only about 16% uh, didn't make it. While uh, on the TOSI arm, uh, 89% survive and 10% uh, uh, didn't make it. So looking at the baricitinib arm, amongst those who, who survived, um, 59 of them or 58% of them have been discharged. Uh, this is uh, at the point of writing. Lah. This, this data has been uh, collected uh, up to 10th of June, is it? 8th of June. And um, at, at, at that point of time, uh, this was the breakdown of the patient's outcome. Those who survive um, have been discharged, 58% have been discharged, while 10% uh, are still in the ward and 15.8% were still in ICU. So for those on TOSI, uh, 48% um, who survived uh, were, were discharged, so slightly less than, than um, uh, baricitinib. 32% uh, were still in the ward and 99% uh, are, are in ICU. Lah. So the length of stay is not much different between the baricitinib and tocilizumab arm, but actually the outcome here uh, has some statistical, statistical was um, statistically significant uh, with a p-value of 0 0.002. Uh, because most of the patients are started on baricitinib in ICU, so basically uh, a majority of them are in ICU. Lah. Uh, for TOSI, some of them who didn't respond, who still deteriorate dis despite starting TOSI in the ward, will end up in ICU as well. And amongst those on baricitinib, uh, our intensivists still, still insisted using baricitinib despite uh, um, there were not much... Uh, a data on uh, ventilated patients. So among that 101 patients, 39% of the patients were ventilated, while 42% um, are not uh, requiring ventilation. Okay, so this is quite interesting. Um, this slide is on the outcome of patients on baricitinib. So yes, this is the this is the graph for those who are ventilated and these are for those who are not ventilated. So the orange graph represents those who 
survived and the blue graph shows those who died. So amongst ventilated patients, 70% 70, 70 of them survive and only 30% who didn't make it. And for those who are not ventilated, 91% are still alive and 9% um, uh, didn't, uh, didn't, didn't make it. So this one is because th there was not much, uh, most of the patients, we managed to extract this data because of the um, fact that ICU has a computerized a way of keeping their information and data. So 18, 18 of them were in a non-IC ward, uh, although it is basically managed, it is in our first class ward, lah, this 18 patient. Uh, so it's like a modified ICU setting. Therefore, we didn't manage to get the data um, uh, to process the analysis. Oops. So this is uh, the graph on patients on tocilizumab. And um, the orange graph represents those who survive. And the blue one is those who didn't make it. So this is the ventilated patients. So not, not many uh, end up being ventilated. And um, um, this is the, sorry, not, not many. Uh, yeah, so this is the, those who are not ventilated. And uh, as you can see, uh, quite a majority of them actually survive lah, with TOSI. So the mean length of stay for baricitinib is uh, 11 days. And the median length of stay is eight for baricitinib. For TOSI, it's eight mean. Median is five. Uh, um, we managed to uh, do a survival curve uh, to look at the survival uh, rate versus the length of stay in ICU. And if you take it at day 10 of ICU stay, um, and you can find that the green line, which represents C has a 0.3% survival percentage uh, compared to the baricitinib curve which is higher, 0.4% of survival. But it's not statistically significant. Oops. For the ventilate, ventilated days, um, so at any point, um, you can see that both uh, baricitinib and uh, at, at day 10, for example, day, day 15 of ventilated days, the survival rate for baricitinib is higher, 0.2 compared to tocizilumab, which is only about 0.1% of survival rate. However, it's also not statistically significant. Okay, there is um, a small number of patients who ended up receiving both TOSI and baricitinib. So what happens is we start the patient on TOSI and um, they didn't improve and subsequently uh, admitted to ICU. And in ICU, they give, give uh, the patients baricitinib. And amongst those who were given both TOSI and baricitinib, 38 of them survive and um, two of them unfortunately died. Yeah. So this is the cost comparison for for both Bari and uh, tocilizumab. So the mean um, duration of treatment that uh, our intensivists use is about seven, four days, four to seven days. So that's a lot of cost saving lah compared to tocilizumab. Uh, that's that's the end of my presentation. Uh, hi everyone, Assalamualaikum. So I'll be talking about uh, new options of treatment in COVID. Uh, basically, I'll go through two papers. Um, okay. 
So uh, as introduction, Regeneron is uh, actually a monoclonal antibody. Um, basically, it has high specificity and it has been used in other uh, previous viral diseases like RSV and treatment. So it's quite uh, in Ebola and it is quite safe. So how it works, uh, it binds to the spike protein of the virus, thus uh, blocks the entry to the host cells. So there are a lot of uh, papers, uh, uh, trials, ongoing trials, uh, some of them using monotherapy uh, and monoclonal antibodies, some of them using uh, combination. Um, so uh, the one that uh, we are looking at, the dual combination is uh, caserivimab and imdivimab. Uh, it's an IV cocktail of uh, two monoclonal antibody. So these are the first paper which focus on the use of regen cough in outpatients. So this is actually an interim analysis. Uh, it is ongoing uh, phase uh, three trials. And they do this interim analysis when the samples at the 275. So what they did is uh, they divide into three arms. Uh, each is one to one to one ratios. One arm uh, receiving placebo, one arm receiving low dose of uh, Regeneron, Regen cough, which is 2.4 gram. Um, one arm is in a higher dose, uh, which, are, which is uh, given 8 gram. So what they are looking at, number one, cessation of uh, symptoms. Number two, reduction in viral load. Number three is uh, the outcome of uh, patient needing uh, hospital visits at day 29. So um, as you can see, the demographics are propensity match, median age group in a younger group around 40s. Um, and they did a baseline uh, antibody at randomization. So 45% are seronegative, 40% are seropositive, and 15% is unknown. Um, so what they can conclude is, uh, those with uh, zero negative, they have the higher viral load, which is uh, uh, log seven, compared to zero positive, where the viral load is log three. Um, and the mean uh, symptoms before randomization, before they start giving, uh, they, they randomize these people into the, those arms at 3.5 days uh, of onset. So what they can see, uh, the outcome is time to elevation of symptoms. Those receiving placebo, it took them nine days to elevate the symptoms compared to those in treatment group. For low dose of region cough, it took about six days. For those with a high dose of region cough, it took about eight days. And those with zero in zero negative group, those in placebo zero negative took about 13 days to uh, elevate the symptoms. And those in treatment group, it's about uh, half of that. Uh, it's about six to eight days uh, of them to, to elevate the symptoms. So the, it is very significant in zero negative group. So this graph shows the baseline of viral load. As you can see, so where's my... Right. As you can see, these are those with the lower viral load, uh, log 10 to the power of 4. And the most right is log 10 to the power of 7. So this group has the highest viral load. After about day 3 uh, post-randomization, post-treatment, you can see the viral load has reduced remarkably from 7.5 to 4.5 and the at, uh, at day seven of randomization, it goes down, the viral, the viral load goes down to half of it. So it shows that uh, this uh, cocktail uh, sh uh, sh give a very uh, remarkable uh, impact to those with higher viral load at randomization. If you look at the most left of the chart, uh, this is at the viral, those with the lower viral load at 10 to the power of four copies. The, after three days, the reduction is not as steep as this group. Okay. And for the, in terms of outcome uh, in uh, a real, and patient needing hospitalization at day 29, 
uh, in placebo group, about 15% of the patient needs to come back to the hospital compared to the treatment group. Um, for those with uh, given um, lower dose of uh, the cocktail, 4.9%, those with a higher cocktail, 7.7%. So in overall treatment group, 6.3% uh, of patients has to come back compared to placebo group, 15% of them needs to come back. So then uh, uh, some may ask how long this uh, monoclonal antibody lasts. So they look at the patient's serum level um, at around day 28 or day 30, uh, the serum level is still high. So which means it can last up to about one month uh, after, the first, uh, after the first dose given. So from that interim analysis, comes to this uh, recovery regen trial. So this is a randomized uh, control open level trial which done at 127 uh, UK hospital. So what they want to see is uh, they divide it into two arms, standard care alone plus standard care with IV regen cough. But in this uh, study, they give a higher dose. Previous study, the outpatient one, they divided into two mild, uh, lower dose and higher dose. For this paper, they give higher dose straight away, which consists of four gram of caserivimab and four gram of indivimab. So they want to see the 28 day mortality uh, in zero negative patient and then compared with the overall uh, patient. During this uh, study was done, at that time, from December to April in UK, the dominant variant is alpha variant. So it shows that this cocktail seems to be working on alpha variants. There are some uh, papers found that there are mutations in beta and delta variant, but because of this cocktail contains of two different monoclonal antibody, this can reduce um, uh, reduction of neutralization, meaning it still can be uh, work on beta and delta variant. So this is how they divide it into two arms. One is region cough cocktail. One is a standard care alone. So the, uh, the number, the sample numbers are quite huge for about 4 point, uh, almost 5,000 uh, in each arm. So these are the baseline demographics. Uh, compared to the outpatient study, uh, this patient's age group is a bit uh, older. Um, it is in 63 to 64 years old. Uh, again, it's propensity match in both arms. So they divide it into zero negative because they are, their aim is to see at 28 days mortality in zero negative patient compared to all patients regardless uh, antibody status. So um, they give uh, to the patient that needs, majority of them needs only nasopron to face mask, so simple oxygen. 66% of them, uh, upon randomization, needing uh, low dose of oxygen, 20% needing NIV, and about only 2% needing uh, invasive ventilation. All right, so um, from the whole sample, 1,000 of uh, 1,600 are zero negative and the rest of them 2,600 uh, 2, are, are zero positive. And majority of them, of course, uh, already ongoing, already have a steroids treatment ongoing. So these are the uh, outcomes that they want to see. Um, in 28 days mortality, those with the treated group has shows a reduction in mortality percentage, which, which is only 24% compared to the standard care is about 30%. And I'll, okay, let's look at this uh, graph. Zero negative versus zero positive. So the first, uh, the upper one is zero negative, the lower one is zero positive. So as you can see the mortality rate uh, in zero negative group, those treated with uh, region cough uh, cocktail reduce about 24% compared to 30% zero negative um, um, standard care group. But if you look at the zero positive arm, the mortality, uh, sorry, zero positive patients, the mortality of both arms does not differ much. So it shows that it works more in those zero negative group. 
And again, when you uh, see at the whole participant, despite uh, zero negative or zero positive, the mortality uh, has not, uh, it does not differ that much. So these are the forest plot. Um, the three outcomes that they, they want to see uh, in um, the, the treated group, uh, which they, they divided into zero negative and zero positive, or the standard care arm, again, divided by zero negative and zero positive. So the death within 28 days, as I mentioned, in zero negative group, it has some remarkable uh, remark, uh, reduction, 24% compared to 30%. As compared to zero positive, the death, the death is about the same in both arms. In terms of outcome of discharge uh, from the hospital, uh, the zero negative group has, uh, with the region cough cocktail, has a higher percentage of being discharged compared to the usual care. But again, if you look at the zero positive group, the numbers are the same, the outcome is the same. In terms of the patient needing uh, invasive ventilation or leads to death, um, again, in zero negative shows a better outcome. Only 30% of them needing ventilation or resulted to death compared to the usual care. And in zero positive group, both arms has no difference. So yeah, this is again the, the highlighted, uh, the death again, uh, significant reduction in zero negative group. The discharge um, alive in zero negative group is higher. And most of them are discharged within 13 days compared to 17 days in, in um, usual care group. And in terms of needing uh, invasive, the zero negative group treated with region cough has a lower risk to progress to uh, ventilate, uh, invasive ventilation. So in terms of safety profile, so they look at after 72 hours of randomization, basically it's only had a low grade of uh, hypersensitivity reaction. 4% uh, of them has fever and hypotension episode and 2% have a uh, thrombotic event. However, they, they, they did not specify which kind of thrombotic event. So for conclusion, I think this uh, cocktail of monoclonal antibody has impact in those zero negative patients. Um, and then it uh, increased the rate of discharge and reduced the progression to ventilated. Um, but the thing is, uh, when they did the trial, they at randomization, they did this uh, antibody using uh, high-end lab uh, rather than POCT uh, type of uh, antibody. So I think that's the limitation if we want to use it to apply it here. And, but uh, I think this, uh, this uh, treatment cocktail is uh, promising la, in a zero negative group. Yeah. So that's all for me.